Good evening, church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we come and we we bow at your feet, Father God, and we are in awe of you, Jesus. We're in awe, God, of the things that you show us, Father God. I just sit back and I, I realize, God, that just these last few days, Lord, how much you have grown me, God. And I know that it's the same for a lot of people, God, in this room. God. So we just sit back and we can marvel at where we were just a year ago, God, and where we are now, Lord. I thank you for that, God. I thank you for always moving, God, always being at work, God, in our lives. Even when we don't see it, God, even when we don't sense it or feel it, Father God, we know that it's there. We know that you are working. God, I pray, I pray that our hearts would be so focused on you, God. Lord, I don't want to miss a thing. And God, I pray for your grace to, to be able to see it all. Oh God, to see your hand move and shape and work, God. I'm going to sing hallelujah, Jesus.
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart.
let the flames shine bright, racing louder. God, you're so good. God, you're so Even in our failures, God, even when our faces are in the dirt and we're realizing our sins, God, even then you say, I love you, son. I love you, daughter. I'm here for you. Get back up. It's time to go. So good to us, God. Lord Jesus, I pray now, God, that our hearts would be open to your word, Jesus. 
that our eyes wouldn't be focused on the world, God, that our eyes wouldn't be focused on that which has no nourishment for our souls, but that we would be focused on Jesus, high and lifted up, glorified. And Lord, I pray that you would use Pastor Roger right now, God. You would use his his mouth, God, as your voice, God, to speak. That you would show us mighty and wondrous things, God, through your scriptures. Let us cherish them, God. Don't let it be just a book to us, but the words, the very words of God, the very words of life and light and hope and peace and joy and love. Oh, God, you are so good to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Great Amen. crowd for Wednesday night Bible study. Mm-hmm. Tonight, our junior high and our high school will be in with us, studying as we're going through the, the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 24. And uh, good time of worship. Midweek service, midweek Bible study. Going through the book of Acts, looking at the life of Paul. Paul is in Roman custody. He has been falsely accused, and, uh, and Paul will spend now the rest of his life in Roman custody. He, Paul won't be released out of Roman custody. He will be beheaded. Have you ever been truly falsely accused, where someone has thought, and said something of you and accused you of something that, that you didn't do. And, and, and it's crazy how they just totally just manufacture a complete story. Right? We're all, we've all had that done to us to some degree or another. It is crazy today. Politically, you can't believe anything you hear or you read. Right? It's just, it's politically, it's fabricated, you know. Uh, how much of truth is in there? How, is, is there just an element of truth or a partial truth? We, I just, you know, I, just, I want the truth. And the truth is really hard to find these days. But for children of God who are abiding in God, we're, we're in the truth. And, and when you're in the truth, you're in the light. And God seems to be working in your life. And, and that's wonderful. That's a wonderful thing. That should bring peace. And it should, it should cast out stress and anxiety. We can walk in freedom knowing our lives are in God's hands when we know we're right with God. Amen. And when we're right with man. Right? I mean, that, that's, that right there, there's, there's a, a larger percentage of the world, are, they don't feel that way. They're not right with man and they're not right with God. Paul is right with man. He's right in God's eyes. And so regardless of what story is fabricated here in chapter 24, he can stand. And he he doesn't need an attorney. He doesn't need a lawyer. The Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they'll bring an attorney on the scene that will just completely manufacture the story and just lie. But Paul, he's in the truth. There's something protective about the truth. Regardless if the world's coming against you. And, and that's the lesson that we need to take away tonight. I mean, the application as we read our story and we get it, abide in the truth, right? Abide in the light. Abide in the vine. Abide in Jesus. And you'll bear the fruit that you need to bear. We need to, we need to you know, if Paul at one point will say, I, it, it's made my, I, I, I strive to be right with God and right with man. That, and and it's, it's powerful, where all those accusers, they can't say that. They can't say that. Well, here in Acts 24, uh, the, the most important part of the whole passage is, is not the liars. It's, it's going to be tonight Paul's defense. Paul's defense. As he defends himself before his accusers who are just bringing accusations and lies that they can't support. Let's go ahead and read, and we're going to break this up into three sections. So we're going to read Acts 24, 1 through 9, then we're going to look at that, 
study that a little bit, and then go on down from 10 all the way down through 21, study that, break that apart, that's Paul's defense, and then we're going to look at 22 through 29. So 24, chapter, oh sorry, 10, 10 through, yeah, 21, and then 22 through 27, sorry, 24, 1 through 9. Now after five days, Ananias and the high priest came down with the elders, or the Sanhedrin, right? And a certain orator, Tertullus, these gave evidence to the governor, that's Felix, against Paul. And when he had called upon Tertullus, right, when he called upon him, he began his accusations, but saying this first, right, seeing that, this is, his, this is how he approaches Felix, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to, uh, brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy, by your graciousness, is what that really means, a few words from us. This guy is eloquent with his speech, right? Talk some more about that. Verse 5, for we have found this man, speaking of Paul, a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, <laughs> a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to the law. But the commander, right? Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourselves, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. Those with the high priest. They were in agreement. False accusations. Here what we see here, guys, is after five days now, the high priest and the Sanhedrin came down, right, with Tertullus to make their accusations or uh, their, their uh, point uh, why Paul should be put to death. And what they wanted, they wanted Paul to be released into their custody, you see, the things that they're bringing before the Roman council, remember Paul is, it has to, he, he's being really protected by Rome because he's a Roman citizen. And so a Roman citizen has to stand before his accusers and be found guilty. If found guilty, then they could turn Paul over to the Jews, which they would kill him, which they set out to do there in Jerusalem just a few days ago. And so what we have here, though, is they bring this attorney, really, a skilled lawyer to present their case. It doesn't take, uh, you know, much more than a, a fourth grade reading level here to understand that this guy just comes on the scene and just brown noses. He just smoozing Felix over, right? He's just, oh, you know, just, it, it's really just too much. It's too dressy. His, his language is just all dressed up. He, he's, he's completely flattering Felix. Isn't that what liars have to do? You know, if you're telling the truth, you don't have to flatter anybody. Paul doesn't, when it's his time to speak in verse 10, he doesn't set out to flatter Felix. He sets out to speak the truth and to make the truth known. That's powerful. So it says, they gave evidence to the governor, right? This is Ananias again, the elders, the Sanhedrin, the skilled lawyers, lawyer here in this case makes you just think a little bit of just up to them how badly they wanted Paul because all that they're saying they're, they're all false accusations that we're going to look at tonight but man listen sometimes the enemy will just not let up and, and regardless of of where you are politically because this is all politically political motivated from a political and religious standpoint and it, it's hinging on the politics of the day with Rome it's 
It's all mingled in here, and we'll talk about that. But good gracious, whether you, whether you wanted to vote for Trump or not, that was just falsely accused. It, it's a lot of the same type of thing here. He was railroaded, and, and Paul's being railroaded by just lies and accusations and, and you know, false news and false information. And it's funny how the enemy can gather like they can and do that to a person. Maybe you've been falsely accused like that. It amazes me the influence that the enemy can gather so quickly. But they were serious about convicting Paul. They wanted Paul and they wanted to kill him. The enemy wants to kill the gospel message. He, he, he doesn't want to just silence you. He wants to kill it. He, he wants to just put an end to it. Here in verses 2 through 4, Tertullus here, he comes and he, he begins again, like I said, flatter Felix. This is crazy. You know, most almost, he, he's, in fact, he spends more time on his introduction flattering Felix than he does in pronouncing the accusations. But it's a false flattery. For Felix, he knows that Paul is innocent. He knows that these men are liars. And we'll see in the end that he, he just refuses to make a decision even if you know the truth. Now let's talk just a little bit about Felix. Phoenix, we know from biblical history that Felix was known for his violence and his overuse of force. You see, Felix was a very unique person within the governing ranks of Rome. He was the first Roman to be delivered from slavery and receive a political position as governor. Up to this point, no one had ever done that. He had received, he had won his freedom, and now he had risen to the point of rank of governor. But like most politicians, you don't get there on your own merits. He got there on the merits of his brother, who was good friends with Nero. <laughs> the Roman historian Tacius had this to say about Felix. Felix exercised the prerogatives of a king with the spirit of a slave. He ruled with a mixture of cruelty and lust and severity, just like evil. He was notoriously wicked. Now, Felix, he had had three wives, and at this point, he was with his third wife. Now, we don't know the name of his first one, but the second and the third had the same name, Drusilla. Now, the second Drusilla was the granddaughter of Cleopatra. She was really highfalutin. You know, politicians, they marry important, you know, important chicks, right? It's pretty crazy, right, how the Bible mixes in with this kind of stuff. But the wife that he had had has now, Drusilla, the third wife, was the great-granddaughter of Herod the Great, which would have been the granddaughter of Herod Antipas, the Herod who had ordered John to be beheaded, that is, John the Baptist. Now, word has it that Drusilla was extremely beautiful and ambitious. She was in the neighborhood only 20 years old at this point. And Felix had wooed her away from her previous husband through magic. He hired a, a magician. There was a sense of the occult right? he used in order to lure his, this, his, this Drusilla away from her previous husband. <laughs> this was definitely an unrighteous relationship, to say the least. But ironically, Drusilla was a Jew. Now, this meant that she would have understood situations that maybe Felix had a hard time understanding, specifically this one. And as we get on down into our text tonight, we'll understand that at one point, he will call Drusilla in and wants her opinion of the situation. It would have been hard for Felix, and especially Drusilla, to have not heard of Jesus. 
specifically that he had risen from the dead, they would have known this. This this was not silent in the known world. And especially Roman governors who had their ear to the ground, who were married to a Jewish woman of influence, they knew. And so later on in our passage tonight, when they're talking about, when Paul's making his defense and he's talking about the resurrection, he's, he's preaching Jesus to them. And they know what he's saying is true, that it's documented fact, but they refuse to, they refuse to make a decision. In Acts 26, 26 through 28, Paul will stand before Drusilla's brother, Agrippa, and he will say things like this. You know all these things, Paul will say to him. Since this thing wasn't done in a corner, he tells Agrippa, Drusilla's brother, speaking of Christ and his resurrection. And then he'll say to Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe, Agrippa. And then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Now, he says, seeing that though that through you we enjoy great peace, he's he's flattering them with prosperity, right? Is being brought to this nation by your wisdom, by your foresight, by your Wonderful leadership, Felix. You're, you're such a great leader. Now remember, the, the Romans and, and the, well, the Jews despised the Romans. There was always some kind of insurrection rising up, and they'll allude to it in our passage. When it talks about the sect of the Nazareth, Nazarenes, like, like, well, I'll get to it in a second, but there was always division. And here, this is just such a false sense of flattery and and smooshing him over. <laughs> That's a word I make up, smooshing him over. <laughs> All flattery. <laughs> Four different times in the book of Proverbs, flattery is connected with sin and the sin of sexual immorality. Just two of them here, Proverbs 20. Verse 19 says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. This means that we aren't to make flatterers our close friends. Right? The next one is Psalm 78, 36. It speaks of trying to flatter God, which is just foolish. But uh, down here in verse 5, what we see here is now Tertullus goes to the accusations after flattering Felix. He says this, for we find this man a plague. (laughs) I've been accused of a lot of things, but never a plague. (laughs) Like COVID, right? (laughs) This guy's simply COVID. You know, Everybody that gets around him is dying, right? It's like, this guy's disgusting. Everybody wants to, you know, think about how, what, how they're presenting him as a plague. <laughs> a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. <laughs> that, we, they, what they're doing now is they're flattering Paul, and they don't even know it. I'm reaching the whole world. A ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He tried to profane the temple. We seized him. We wanted to judge him. We wanted to kill him, really. <laughs> they didn't want to judge him. They were trying to bring him to some kind of Jewish court of law. In the previous chapters, they were beating him to death. When this Roman commander rescues Paul from these guys. So he's lying right here. Listen, it's real important to understand that all three of these accusations are motivated politically, right? But first off, they're calling Paul a politically dangerous man. 
when they say, we found this man a plague. Now, there's three accusations. First, Paul here is being convicted of a worldwide troublemaker, one who stirs up riots everywhere he went. Secondly, he's being convicted as a leader. The, call, the New King James uses ring leader of a, of a Nazarene sect. Again, here, thirdly, he's being accused now, now in the original language, the word is attempt or attempted to desecrate the temple. A few chapters earlier, they didn't say he attempted. They said he did it, right? Listen, the first one here, where Paul is being accused of being a worldwide troublemaker, had serious political penalties. You see, Rome desired to maintain order throughout the empire. That they, that's what their, their force was. We're going to you know, maintain peace. We're going to have things our way by way of force. Anybody steps out of line, gets crushed. But most of the revolts that did rise up, right, rose up against the Roman government. And most of them that rose up, rose up from the region of Galilee. Nazareth, a Nazarene, was considered a Galilean. Okay? And so here they are accusing Paul of starting a revolt against the Roman government. And the Roman government would never tolerate that. So it's falsely accused, but they're accusing him of something that they know Felix should put him to death right now over. That's just the first one. The second one was here that, that, um, that uh, was a governing concern as well here. Because Tertullus made it out, right? Or made it appear that Christianity was separate. Or one theologian said, divorced from Judaism. Now today, ironically, a lot of people see that as Christianity as a separate separate. Divorced from Judaism. Now, we are, we are being grafted into that olive branch. Now, there's a lot from a religious standpoint. There's a difference between a Jew and a Christian. A Christian is a born-again Jew. That's what a Christian is, a follower of Christ. And so what they're doing is they're going to accuse Paul of going against Judaism, of going against the law and the prophets, and that's going to be one of his defenses. He goes, no, 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 I, I haven't gone against the law or the prophets at all. In verses 10 down through 21. But this is a big deal. This is a governing concern here that Tertullus is bringing. Because you see, the Romans permitted Judaism as a legal religion. But Rome wasn't tolerant of any new religious beliefs outside of that. They had their Greek gods that they ordained and they okayed, and then there's Judaism. Any kind of revolt or any kind of faith that rose up out of anything else was not tolerated. And basically, they were presenting the way or Christianity or Paul's faith, he's a ringleader of, as a revolt, religious movement that was coming against the Roman government. False accusation. And third, was that Paul had attempted to desecrate the temple. Again, this too had political overtones. Because the Romans had given the Jews permission to execute any Gentile that violated the temple by going past the court of the Gentiles, going beyond their place. That was a holy place. And the Gentile was permitted to come in, but only come in so far. And the Romans... They said, okay, you, you have the right. If, if somebody desecrates your temple, we understand. You can handle it. So there's political overtones here as well. Tertullus had changed the original charge of Acts 21, 28, where Paul was charged with bringing Troifimus into the temple. But Tertullus gave no evidence for this charge 
Because there was no evidence. Because it didn't happen. It was fabricated. They created a rumor. And now, now that they're standing before Felix, it's, they're accusing him of, of attempting to do so. Back in Acts 21, they said he did it. Ironically, Tertullus, the same man who found it so easy to flatter Felix with words, also found it easy to accuse Paul with no evidence. Isn't that the way liars work? Right. He had changed. He's being guilty of, of, of creating havoc throughout the world. But this is important as I begun. Paul had nothing to fear because he was in the right and he was in the truth. Paul had to stand or, or lean on his faith in light of false accusations. And, and I just wonder when the day arises when, when Christians really begin to be falsely accused, how are we going to react? I, I think this is a wonderful chapter. I hope we go back to this and, and learn how to react when people falsely accuse us. A lot of us want to just, you know, pick up our weapons and fight, you know. But, but that's not what Paul does at all. He stands in God's strength and in God's wisdom and in God's truth. Now we're going to jump on down. Looking at verse 7 now. But the commander, right, <clears throat> here Lysisius came by, he says, with great force and took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers come to you. Now, have you ever been thrown under the bus for doing the right thing? That's what this Roman commander is being accused of by your own people, right? In a sense, that you were sent to protect he was sent, a commander, over thousands, right? He's over thousands there in Jerusalem of the Roman guards sent to bring peace and keep Jerusalem safe. And these guys are throwing him under the bus. Towards the end of our text, Felix will want to hear from this guy as well. You know, it would have made sense if he would have came right with them. And I just wonder if they made it you know, uh, made, a, made something happen so where that this commander stayed back and didn't come because he would have told the truth. A Roman commander would have had to tell the truth. His life depended on it. He's thrown under the bus. You know, here it, it, the whole story has changed. They're acting as if we were just going to bring him before our courts, and if finding him guilty, oh, then we would, then we would, you know, he would, he would be judged accordingly, right? Which would be death. But they were beating him to death when the commander rescued him. So they weren't going to had no intentions on bringing Paul before a court or examining him. In fact, Tertullus didn't even try to offer any evidence of the charges. It appears as though he was hoping that Paul, what we would call get in the flesh and try to defend himself, and in doing so, hang himself. I think that's what they were trying to do. Get, get, get you frustrated, get you all flustered, and, and so where you, start, you start defending yourself. You know, Jesus, when he stood before Pontius Pilate, there's a word there, where it's, it's vindication, it's vindicate. Jesus didn't vindicate himself before Pontius Pilate. He didn't start saying, do you know who I am? I'm the son of God. You know, like, you know, almost like a Clint Eastwood attitude. 
you know, go ahead, punk, you know, make my day, you know, you're, you're feeling lucky, you know, type of attitude, and, and I think Christians kind of do that, but we try to vindicate ourselves, and in this passage, Paul is not really necessarily fighting this battle in the flesh or trying to vindicate himself. Now, he's going to speak, he's going to give his account of the truth and the way things are for the sake of the gospel. I mean, he's trying to lead these guys to Christ, more than he is trying to save his own hide when you look at the passage. <laughs> Again, this group that came from Jerusalem, the high priest, the Sanhedrin, quote, elders, and Tertullus, they were all in agreement, but they had no evidence to support their accusations. Let's go ahead and read now Acts 24, uh, picking up in uh, verse 10. And then Paul, after the governor had uh, nodded to him, like, go ahead, it's your turn, right? Answered. And then Paul, so Paul says this, inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to just simply worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor enticing the crowd, either in the synagogue or in their city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men, now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me, purified in the temple, neither with a mob or a tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say, if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement, which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. Powerful statement. Paul gives his defense. One of the things that he does is he exposes the lies that are brought against him. As much as I know that you have been the judge of this nation, you're like, for many years, you've been governor. It's my joy to just bring, to, 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 to uh, go ahead and speak for myself, to answer for myself. He points out that it's been 12 days all this has happened in 12 days. 12 days ago, he shows up to just simply, with alms and offerings for those Jews and those in, in, uh, in Jerusalem that were being persecuted, that were under hard times. He has an offering for them, basically like missionary support from Gentile churches. And he's trying to make things right. And what is, the, what is the Christian council? What do the apostles tell them to do? Listen, this is what you're being accused of. You're, you're being accused of preaching a different gospel and, and lying about Judaism, that, that it, none of this matters anymore. It's kind of the same accusations that they're bringing against him now. And, he, and so what you need to do, Paul, is, is you really need to purify yourself, take a vow, and in doing so, support these other men. And they'll pay for their way to take this vow. And in doing so, all of Jerusalem and everybody in the synagogue and all those born-again Jewish Christians will understand that, that you're not what everybody's saying you are.
Just 12 days, all of this transpired. Boy, has anything just went from, just, just went, just tanked, and just like, it's amazing how bad things can go so fast. But Paul knew it was in his best interest to speak for himself. He gives them just the facts without flattery. It says, and they neither found me in the temple, disputing with anyone or enticing the crowd, either in the synagogue or in the city. So he, 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 he shares something completely different, a completely different story. Now this would have been the time for them to stand up and say, liar, here's the proof. Because basically Paul's saying, prove it nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me, is what he says. So Paul now will explain his ministry and, while he, and why he was, he was taken under arrest in 14 through 21. <laughs> but this I confess to you. This is my confession I'm going to own this, that according to the way which they call a, a sect, a separate faith, some kind of revolt that's trying to rise up and take over Rome, something that was trying to come against Judaism and against the Roman government. So I worship God. And nothing, there's nothing in here about Rome. There's nothing in here about his accusers. I worship God, the God of my fathers. Trusting, right? Believing in all things that were written in the law and the prophets. They're saying his original accusation, as I said, was that he was going against the law and against the prophets. I have hope in God. Those are powerful words, especially when you're being falsely accused. Your hope has got to be in God. He says, hope in God, which they also accept, and a resurrection from the dead, which they also accept, of the just and un of the unjust, It's kind of funny when you think about it. According to the way, Paul had not abandoned Judaism as he was being accused. Again, Tertullus called Christianity a sect of the Nazarenes. And back in Paul, in 20, Acts 24, 5, he says, Paul is saying, I call it the way. And it seems like the theological thing that seems to be on the platform or on the table here, if there's any theology that's on the table, it's the resurrection. Back to the resurrection of the dead. And this was believed amongst most Jews. We know not the Sanhedrin, or the Sadducees, excuse me, but most of the Pharisees. But here, Paul's belief that there will be a resurrection was connected to his specific trust in the resurrection of Jesus. Here he's, he's preaching Christ to them because they know. They heard the story. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 says this. Now if Christ is preached, Paul says, that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then we, excuse me, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ from the dead, or raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact 
the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. He, he's disputing the fact of the resurrection. Saying if there's no resurrection, then there's no Savior. And he's taking this gospel, this gospel message to the Jews who believe in the resurrection. His accusers. And there's a resurrection, both of the just and the unjust. I wonder at that point if he made eye contact with Felix and the Pharisees, the high priest, and Tertullus. I would have. So he reminds them, I came and I, I was bringing gifts. I was bringing aid, not hate, to Jerusalem. He's speaking of, again, that collection that Paul made for his Judean Christians there in Jerusalem from the Gentile churches. But his answer to all that is, they ought to have been here before you to object. He's saying all these things are true, and there was a multitude of people that would vouch for this. And yet, where are they? Where are my accusers? Or, you know, where, where, or where is the proof? Of, uh, that my accusers bring. That's what he's asking. Paul makes a strong defense. You know, right now, today, in the world in which we're living, Christians, many of us are getting more and more angry and more and more frustrated. I meet with people, it's almost on a daily or every other day, I talk with somebody it's just they're, just, they're just ready to pull their hair out. One, one more evil, one more thing they've heard, one more issue they're dealing with. I can't believe this. I can't believe that. This has happened. I can't believe that's happening. It's causing people of all ages to kind of come unraveled in a sense. Listen, you know, we live in a fallen world. And the Apostle Paul, he knew how to minister to a fallen world. Jesus knew how to minister to a fallen world. Sometimes I think we, we're looking to minister to a, to, a, to a world that will receive our message. But that's not the case. And it's really never been the case. It's not the case with Paul or the rest of the Apostles. Wasn't the case with the first century church? They were persecuted and put to death by the, at the, towards the end of the first century. The church has always been persecuted for standing for righteousness, for standing for truth against the world. I, I think we have to draw on wisdom and we have to draw on God's strength. Faith, faith stands strong in Christ regardless of the attack. I can stand in the Lord. Paul talks a lot about standing through his epistles. And I see him doing that right here. Paul, he, he doesn't get shook up. He, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't go one way or the other regarding emotions. You know, you, could get, you can get real timid and, and just, you know, when people attack you, you can get timid and you can just recoil or you can now all of a sudden you try to vindicate yourself and you get all crazy and you want to fight everybody. You're Paul, Paul's in neither one of these. He's not taken over by his emotions. He's standing on truth. He's unashamed for the truth, for his life. And there is no evidence to convict him. There's no accusers. Just like with Jesus, all the accusations were false. Now, 24 through, you know, 22 through 27. But when Felix heard these things, right? Having more accurate knowledge of the way, how, how, did, how did he know? How did he, how did he have more uh, uh, understanding of the way? Because Paul just told him. I think there was more said than what's recorded. They brought false accusations. Paul brought the gospel. And now Felix, is, he's heard the truth. He has now an accurate knowledge of the way. 
the sect, as the Jews were calling it. But what did he do? He adjourned the proceedings. Let's meet another day. He puts it off. Right? When Lysisius, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. He puts it off. Okay, you want, you want more evidence. Now, remember, this, this commander is under Felix's, like, command. You know, he's the Roman governor, and you're just a commander of the army. And, and so the last thing Felix knows, this guy's not going to lie. He's going to tell it just the way it happened. But he puts it off. And in 23, so he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide or to visit him. Wow. He, so, so in his defense, this is the blessing, is Paul didn't come off like a criminal or a killer or a hater. He, Felix goes, just keep an eye on him. You know, let his friends come and bring him food and clothing. And let, him, let, him, let him pray together and have Bible studies together. and just, just keep an eye on him. But he wasn't going to let him go either. He wasn't going to let him go. What we see here throughout the rest of the passage is Felix is a mugwomp. He's got his mug, as Doug would say, he's got a mug on one side of the fence and his womp on the other side of the fence. He's, un, he's not willing to make a decision. He's riding the fence. And so Felix will continue in avoiding making a decision Look at 24. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, he brought her with him, as I said. I think he wanted her opinion. Who was Jewish? There it is, right there in our passage. He sent for Paul, and he heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So Paul, he's still telling Felix and Drusilla about Jesus. And like I said, don't be naive. It's not as if these two had never heard about Jesus and that he had rose from the dead. Now, as, it, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, there's the message. Golly, wouldn't you have loved to have been there and hear the Apostle Paul I mean, most people would be trying to tell Felix what he wanted to hear so that maybe he would be released. I want out of prison. Paul's not concerned about getting out of prison. God can do anything. Paul and Silas had already been released from prison once. Are you kidding me? No problem. I'm going to preach the gospel. And he goes right for the serious topics. Righteousness, self-control, and coming judgment to these two wicked people, right? I mean, just wicked political people, murderers, killers. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get off, but you guys have heard, probably heard the accusations. I'm not saying they're true, or I'm not saying they're false. I'm just, I'm just saying the accusations like against the Clintons, right? All that they've done, that's kind of what this couple, right? I mean, but they're the real deal. You know, whatever they're saying, those people have done, whether they've done it or not, I'm saying these, this couple has done that. They are that couple. And he's telling them about righteousness, self-control. A guy who, he stole her from another man. <laughs> this is crazy stuff. The three points to his sermon. There's your three-point sermon to Felix and Drusilla. Righteousness, living righteous or right in God's sight or doing right in others' eyes. Felix and Drusilla were far from that. They were, well, again, wicked people living openly in their rejection of God's love and law. 
1 Peter 3, 12 says this, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You just wonder what scripture he was telling Felix and Drusilla. Secondly, self-control. Now, I'm sure that they were convicted, right? This was a convicting message. I wonder if they struck a note. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there's no law. Self-control. Everything about appealing to the flesh, indulgences, appetites, desires, whatever they wanted, they got it. You know, that's, you know there's nothing good about getting everything you want. God will never give you everything you want. What happens to a child that you give everything they want to? Spoiled rotten. They end up really being corrupt people, having no guidance, right, in their life. They treat others even horrible. Well, that's, that's, sometimes that's people, not just politicians, but people of great wealth. They, nobody can ever tell them no. You know, I call that like the king effect. You know, and some of these professional athletes have that. I mean, they're making so much money, and they're so influential. Movie stars, you know, music peop, you know, people. I mean, they're so influential. They're so powerful. They're so wealthy. Nobody's going to tell me no. Why do you think when King David was up on the rooftop of his house, when he should have been out to war, and he said, get me that woman. Do you think anybody stood up and said, whoa, 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 David, what are you thinking? That's, that's Uriah's wife. What are you doing? No, 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 he's the king. Nobody said, David, you, you, you don't do that. It's king effect. We got to protect ourselves, right? From being that, having that king mentality. I'm the king, whatever I want. Well, Drusilla and Felix had that mentality. And it made this message of righteousness, self control, and judgment convicting, I'm sure. So convicting, it says in our passage, Felix became afraid, fearful. <laughs> I'm sure that he, in judgment came a message of hell. Which causes those who won't receive Christ to live in fear. You should fear hell. I would say he understood the message clear. Again, those who reject the message and reject Christ should be in fear. And what does he say? After he saw fearful, go away. Go away when I have a more convenient time, then I'll call for you. And every theologian, every commentator you read says the same thing. This is what people do when they hear the gospel. When you share the gospel with them, with them or they come to church and they hear the truth, many people say, you know what, I, I'm convicted and, and, and I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong, and every time they say something, they're taking a step further back. Yeah. But, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. But the word of God says, today is the day of salvation. And, and you know, I was, when someone was talking to me about and discipling me, just weeks prior to that harvest crusade that I ended up going to, do you know what I was telling that person in the weeks prior to that harvest crusade? God was planting seeds. That person said, would you like to receive Christ tonight? I said, no. I'm not ready. Oh, no, I'm not ready. I kept saying that. What if something would have happened, right? What if I would have got hit by a bus while I was saying, not tonight, not tonight, when there's a more convenient time like Phoenix, then I'll address this issue. But you never come back to it. You're not guaranteed that you'll come back to it. You're not guaranteed you'll have another chance. And that's a part of the gospel, To 
26. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. This is Felix. That he might release him. Therefore, he sent him more often sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after uh, uh, two years, right, Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor, so he left Paul bound in prison, right? Just, so Paul's there. He, he's, he, you know, Luke and others are able to come and minister to him, and, and he's writing epistles during this time, Right? And, and, and check it out. He, so Felix, he's holding on to the Apostle Paul. He, he's, not, he's not pronouncing judgment or, or some kind of accusations. You know, he's guilty or he's not guilty. He's not saying anything. And, and, and he's, he's wanting to, to not offend the Jews. He's trying to keep peace. He's trying to pull the whole Pontius Pilate thing. But even, even in the midst of all that, He's hoping that if I hang on to Paul long enough, maybe his buddies are going to get some money together and want to buy him back from me. You know? So if I hang on to him long enough, I might pad my pockets. Is that just, I mean, it's just evil. It's just wicked. That's what it's saying in 26. The money would be given to him by Paul for his release. I'll release him if I can make something off of the deal. Right? But then even after Felix right, was uh, power changed hands, we see Festus now continues by just keeping Paul imprisoned, you know, and, and just, just to keep the Jews happy. All politically motivated. All politically motivated. You know, a lot of people believe that Felix's decisions with Paul was the end of his leadership. That eventually he was found out, he was exposed as a, as a, as a wicked criminal and, and demoted. Demoted. Not his brother, who was Nero's best buddy, couldn't even help him out anymore. How, how much different would his life had been from that point on if he would have received Christ and turned his life over and heard Paul's message? But he was demoted, and now Felix, or excuse me, um, uh, Festus takes his place. There's always, always a consequence here. Always a consequence to our actions. But both of these leaders acted out in pure political motivation, out of pure political motivation, wanting to keep favor with the Jews. You know, it's funny. Even, even evil knows they have to have some kind of influence, you know, friends in high places, in order to, to, to maintain their control. But the righteous... We stand in Christ, right? He's our defense. He's our hope. He's our strength. He's our refuge. He's our strong tower. He's our place of defense. I don't need to trust in myself. I don't need to rely on my own self. Even when the enemy comes against me. And, and this is a perfect example of that passage of how we should act under pressure when people are falsely accusing you of doing something you didn't do. You know, Paul's life was in God's hands, and, and he wasn't going anywhere until God was done with him. And God had already told him that. And he already told him, you're going to go to Rome, and you're going to be presented before, you know, uh, kings and, and, you know, emperors. You're going to be speaking for me. He didn't tell him you'd do that while you were imprisoned. You know, sometimes you, you don't know what, what uh, God's going to do with you, how your life's going to go, you know. We've got to trust the Lord with it. We've got to trust the Lord with it. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the Bible study, Lord. And, and we just ask, God, that you would just continually, Lord, be our strength as we go and, uh, day in and day out, trusting you and depending upon you 
not looking to this world for anything, but trusting in you. Lord, keep us from rising up and trying to vindicate ourselves or to approach evil in our own strength, to do battle against that which is wicked in the flesh, to even come and act like we're fighting against this world. I'm not fighting against this world. This world's going to perish. We know that through our study in Revelation. That you're victorious. If we're going to stand, let it be standing in defense of the gospel. Let us stand on the truth of your word. Let us be unmovable in the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes to go after evil is like going into a room and shutting off the light and swinging at the darkness with a bat. We stand no chance in disposing of the darkness that way. We just need to speak the light, speak the truth. And the darkness will flee. God be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.